So this presentation is all about enterprise selection. Um, when I first began farming, I really didn't know where to begin. Uh, there was just so much information, so much good information out there about how to raise all these different animals in a uh, pasture-based setup that frankly, it was really overwhelming. And when you're, you're new, uh, and you're really excited and amped up, you want to you want to run out and start everything all at once. And I think that's something I see a lot of people do, and I think it's a huge mistake. Um, and that, but beyond that, uh, as we'll talk about, you know, here later in this this uh, uh, presentation, uh, even if you only run out and 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 start out with one enterprise, that doesn't guarantee you that you're not making a huge mistake. Uh, and that's really what um, this presentation is geared towards, is to help you pour everything through a filter and make a rational, non-emotional decision about what to start with first or what to add next or what to focus on doing last. I will tell you uh, an experience I had about two years ago um, when we, uh, we held a workshop, uh, here in, in my hometown and on my farm, uh, I did this presentation, um, uh, in the classroom and there was a, a young guy there from West Virginia. Uh, he traveled all the way to central Indiana to go through this three day in-person workshop and he showed up and, and he, he told us like, uh, you know, I'm going to start with chickens and his plan was to build chicken tractors in his garage all winter long and then go out the following spring and start his pasture poultry enterprise. And after going through uh, this presentation, it totally turned things upside down. And he actually started with pigs and he's building some fence. His next venture is gonna be cattle and chickens are third. So that's the kind of thing that can happen if you, you have a really open mind when we start talking about enterprise selection and uh, why there's so much value that I place on it. You'll see that as we get into this. I start you off this little quote from Benjamin Franklin. If you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. I'm very pragmatic. I'm an engineer by trade. I, I'm, I process everything. So uh, I love that quote, and it really kind of sets the tone for what um, what this presentation is all about. So um, kind of an introduction to enterprise selection. These are some of the topics we're going to cover, uh, how to go about answering the big questions and what those big questions are, uh, a personal example from me personally um, about some of my goals here on our farm, how you go about defining your farm. Uh, choosing the right enterprise for you. Uh, again, it's it's easy to get all excited listening to Greg Judy talk about cows or Joel Salatin talk about chickens, and you think you want to go start that enterprise because of how much success they've had, but that doesn't mean it's the right enterprise for you. Uh, how to analyze a specific enterprise. We'll actually go through and break that down in a very detailed way uh, in this presentation, and then just some points to live by uh, at the end. So enterprise selection is all about determining what to start, uh, when, and why. And I underline why there um, for a very important reason. So here are some of the big questions that are going to need uh, answered. Now, what is the ideal enterprise for you, your land, your market, and your family? You really have to take all of those things into consideration when you go to begin a farming venture or you want to add the next piece uh, to your farming venture. Uh, you know, how do you go about determining what enterprise you're going to start for a second or a third? Like I talked about with the guy from West Virginia, um, you know, he, he had it all planned out. He thought he knew what he wanted to start, but then he decided, you know what, that's probably not the best place for me to start. And there are reasons for that that we'll talk about. Why is it so important to organize your enterprises in terms of priority after a personal assessment. And that is uh, something that Diego talks a whole lot about um, in one of his, his modules in the course is, is doing this, this big, huge personal assessment. It is a lot of work 
It's, uh, it's very introspective. It's something that very few people enjoy doing or want to do. I, I think farmers are probably some of the worst people at wanting to do that big personal assessment, but it's really, really so necessary uh, in, in order to fully understand uh, the, the gravity of what you're about to add to your life, uh, particularly with livestock, because we're talking about animals that are living and breathing. Um, you know, at least in, in my context, on my farm, it's, it's all livestock. Uh, you know, they don't really take a day off. Okay. They don't care that it's, um, you know, Christmas day or it's your kid's birthday or it's the 4th of July. They've got to be taken care of. Now you could definitely apply uh, anything in this presentation to to any operation, but it's it's going to come from a vantage point of livestock because that's what I do on my farm. So our ideal goal, and this is our ideal goal, needs to be to try and design an enterprise that meets the needs, wants, and desires of our personal context, which is what we're passionate about, and our financial goals, okay? So we also need to take into account our land base. So you may say, well, my, my passion is cows, but currently I've only got one acre. Well, you've got a problem unless you're okay with having one cow, okay? Uh, but if you've got one acre and you're open to doing chickens, well, then that, that opens up more avenues, and we're going to talk about that. Now, ideally, each enterprise we choose to operate, it's going to meet both of these above goals fully. Again, this is, this is ideal. So it's going to uh, scratch our, our personal contextual itch and it's going to put money in the bank account. But in reality, uh, you know, some, some enterprises may not meet both, but they might be temporarily necessary to meet a short term or a long term goal. So here's, here's a case in point. Uh, let's assume that our family needs a minimum of about $60,000 annually to live. And let's also assume that, that our goal is that we, we only wanna raise beef cattle. We, we wanna do this because we believe 100% uh, grass-fed beef is the most regenerative food we can raise. It provides the most nutrition to our customers and cattle are what we're most passionate about. So our farm's idealistic long-term Holistic contextual goal is to have all of these financial needs met by a cow-calf beef operation. And, and uh, to take that a step further, to be more ideal, uh, we want this operation, this business to be completely sustainable on farm. So we want to get our herd built up and we want that to provide, you know, all of the animals we're going to finish. We want to have all of the pasture that we need on our farm. We want to produce all of our over the entire system. That's our goal. But to have that enterprise meet our financial goals, and in this example, we're going to need about 100 fenced grazable acres. Uh, we're going to have to have a minimum of 20 calves, 24 yearling stockers, and 24 finishing stockers each season. So we're really, we're talking about a, a hundred head of cattle. Uh, we also need five to seven years of grazing experience with cow-calf pairs, not just stockers, to properly manage this herd. And then in addition to that, uh, if we want to produce all of our own hay, we'd have to have additional acres and hay. We might need another 30 acres to produce hay on. So the value of this herd alone is well over six figures. It's well over $100,000 using uh, conventional market prices. So unless we've got $100,000 laying around to invest just in livestock, along with 100 fenced acres that we own or we're leasing, uh, and we've got a minimum of five years grazing experience with cow-calf pairs, we might need to think about running a pastured poultry or a pork enterprise in the interim to meet our family's financial living needs if, if we're trying to derive some or all of our financial needs from farming. Now, what I want to note here is that like th this is my personal contextual goal. This is what I'm still try trying to achieve on our farm. But this was not my original holistic goal. 
and the point I want to make is that, you know, goals can change over time. If you would have asked me back in 2008, 10 years ago, you know, what, what, what's your contextual goal? It would have been very simply to be farming full time with livestock on my farm. I, I, I hadn't thought this far down the line. I just wanted to be at home. I wanted to be farming. I wanted to have animals. I wanted to be around my family. That's all I knew. No one taught me how to think about pouring all this again through a filter so that you can map it out logistically with numbers intentionally on the back end. So beginning to define your farm. So just like myself in that previous example, uh, a, a pasture, poultry, or pork enterprise might might meet some or all of the following goals in the interim if I if I can't go buy this cattle herd and and, and ha have my ideal farm. Uh, much quicker ROI and cash flow to fund other enterprises, which is exactly what we've done. We've we've taken as many of the proceeds as we could uh, from the poultry and the pigs, and we have reinvested that aggressively into our cattle business. Uh, it also would, you know, would help you. It helped me learn some basic animal management skills. I had never really been around livestock. Yes, my family had livestock when I was a little kid. I was five or six years old. I didn't learn anything about them. So when I first got interested in farming, actually, I was, I was looking at vegetable production. But then when I began to shift over to livestock, it, it scared me to death because I didn't know anything about any animals. Uh, starting with a chicken really helped calm that fear because it was small and more manageable. These, um, you know, smaller, easier, faster enterprises also can give us quick entry into marketing streams. It then gives you an opportunity to build a brand image with an easier to master product. It provides an opportunity to build a customer base to sell that beef to in the long term, which is, again is exactly what happened for us. By the time we had beef available, we had so many people clamoring for it. Everything we had available in a 12 month period was literally gone in a couple of days. And that was the case until just about the last year or two. So in other words, some enterprises may be a means to an end. Uh, and this is completely fine. So long as you define and understand that up front and notice that defining and understanding that up front is bolded and underlined because it's so important. If you've got your heart set on being a master grazer, but you can't start there, then you really need to, to list out why you can't start there, why it is you're starting somewhere else and start to put a plan together so that you can work your way towards that goal and not get frustrated in the interim that you had to start with pigs or chickens or vegetables or, or whatever it is. So questions to understand and answer when you're designing an enterprise to meet your context. What are you most passionate about raising? Completely fine to list that out. List out everything you're interested in in order. It doesn't matter if it's mushrooms, animals, vegetables, honey, really doesn't matter, but list out what you're most passionate about, then your next most pa you know, uh, passionate interest and, and so on and so forth. Then begin to think about, and this is where we start to kind of you know, uh, bring things into focus. What unfair advantage does your land have in terms of production? Uh, is the land cost? low? Does it produce lots of grass? Are there tree crops already there that might feed pigs? Uh, is there infrastructure in place? What unfair advantage does your farm have in terms of geography for, for sales? My farm has a huge unfair advantage based on where I'm located. I am 45 minutes from anywhere in Indianapolis I'm 30 minutes from pretty much anywhere in Bloomington, which is where Indiana University is located. Those two cities have a lot of people. Local food is alive and well. And it, it gives me a huge advantage in terms of 
selling my product. The disadvantage is that land is really expensive. Even leasing property is really expensive. Um, if you talk with some, someone like Greg Judy, his advantage is that land is ridiculously cheap. He can lease tons and tons of acres for next to nothing. But his disadvantage is that he's really far away from big urban centers. So he has to focus on more of a wholesale uh, sales model to move most of his product. He, he doesn't make anywhere near as much money per cow as I do, but I can produce a whole lot less cows than he can. And this is something you've really got to sit back and chew on and think about because it, it then starts to help you think about your marketing strategy. Now, the last big thing you really get to ask is what type of initial investment capital are you willing to make? And again, this is something that Diego talks a whole lot about in his finance module, because this is business. This isn't playing around money. This is, we're seriously going to invest this and we can lose an investment. Note that, you know, this one area alone may dictate your very entrance into farming. For me, it did. I was really clamoring for cows, but I was able to scratch together about 600 bucks to start my farm. Now this year, we're probably gonna break $200,000 in sales. And that's only 12 seasons in from starting with $600. So I wanted to encourage you, it's totally possible. But the lower amount of seed money you start with, the more limited you are on what farming venture you can begin. So what I want you to try and do is to focus on where these answers overlap, the advantages, the passions, the interest, and focus your energy there if at all possible after doing a market assessment. Um, market assessment is not something we're gonna talk about in this presentation. There is a module on that that's pretty long and pretty thick in the course, but once you put those two things together, you can really get a clear picture of which direction you're gonna head. Now, you know, if it isn't possible now to, to, again, to do your ideal business that you wanna begin, how do you begin to focus your energy on that enterprise you cherish most within the next two years, three years, five years, whatever, you start to put some projections together, I think we can make this much money. With this enterprise, we can, you know, uh, and, and we can make this much money in the next three years, then we'll save all that money, then we'll have the seed money to begin the next enterprise. What, whatever that strategy is, write it down, list it out, plan it out, and start to work towards that goal. Now, once you have a focus, you wanna study that enterprise in all aspects, every aspect what's it going to take physically mentally how are you going to market it what's your return on investment i talked about cows uh if i had a calf born this spring i'm not going to get any money out of that calf for two and a half years if i started a a baby chick tomorrow i could get money out of that thing in eight and a half weeks that's a big difference and that's something you got to think about uh what are the capital investment needs you got to do a production cost analysis. Um, we've got a, um, an, another uh, free webinar you can watch on the YouTube channel where we, we go through that with poultry. So it gives you a really good idea of like, what's it going to take to go produce a batch, batch of chickens? Uh, what infrastructure are you going to need? This is an indirect cost analysis. You know, this is building a chicken tractor it might cost you 300 bucks. But you, you can't say uh, the first batch of poultry is going to, you know, carry that entire cost. How many times you're going to use that over the course of a year? You got to start to map that out. Uh, what are the land requirements? How many acres are you going to need? You know, do you need an eighth of an acre to start a vegetable operation? Or do you need 10 acres to start a cattle operation? And most importantly, what are the time requirements? Because so many of us come into farming while working in another sector possibly full-time. Uh, I was an engineer. Uh, you, you name it, I've met them coming through the workshop. CPAs, nurses, uh, military, other engineers, uh, transportation, logistics, you name it, I've met them. There are so many different walks of life that people are in 
and they want to move into farming, they're working a full-time job, they're probably supporting a family, you've really got to stop and think about what are the time requirements to do this enterprise and do it right. And it's not just raising the animal. And I, I feel like that's one of the shortfalls from most teachers in this space is it's not just the animal. I mean, the, the animal husbandry is really only about 25% of the equation. There's so much more that goes into running a, a farm business. Um, it, it's a disservice to tell you that that's the hard part. Frankly, that's one of the easier parts. It's scary at first. Yeah, you got to learn some stuff. But once you have it down, it's running the business that's really hard and takes so much more time. So if you aren't convinced that this is for you, or even if you are convinced, then I would encourage you to volunteer to work on a farm with this enterprise currently running. And when I say currently running, I mean a farm that's in it to, to make money. They're doing it. You get to see it from start to finish. Go out, volunteer there, uh, and make certain... And be beyond your financial comfort level. Okay. Now starting with chickens, like you could start with chickens for less than a thousand bucks. Okay. And if you think you just want to go start with chickens, well, you, you spend some money. I mean, worst case you, you eat them and uh, may, maybe you just had some expensive chickens that you raised and you don't do it again. That's not going to hurt you. That's a paper cut. Blowing $20,000 on the uh, latest, greatest, uh, small heritage breed, you know, best ever um, heritage cow that you can't really make any money with. And then figuring that out on the back end, that's a landmine. That'll kill you. That's all your seed money. You're probably not farming after that. That's what we want to avoid. Now, uh, I've got a friend of mine that a few years ago, his name's Patrick, he um, uh, left one job and uh, he had quite a bit of money that he was gonna be able to invest. And he's, uh, he's up in Canada and uh, he called me and he said, hey, you know, I've got, I've got the opportunity financially, I've got the time, I've got the space, this is what I'm thinking about doing. He said, if I could produce vegetables, I could get into any winter market up here and I could sell more veggies than I could produce. I know I could produce full-time uh, income from a pretty small percentage of my farm. What do you think? I told him the same thing. I said, Hey, you need to go find a farm that's doing this and, and, and work on this farm and see what you think. Now, Patrick and I are about the same age. This has been a few years ago, but we were about 40 years old at the time. And I had a pretty good idea of what his experience was going to be. Patrick is also a big guy. I mean, he's like, you know, 6'5", 240 pounds. He's not, he's not a small man, right? So he finds a farm a few hours away. He calls him up. He says, hey, you know, I want to come visit. I want to work. I have a farm. I'm thinking about doing what you're doing. The lady says, yep, I've got a, I've got a guest room. Come on over. We'll set you up. Uh, he was also interested in doing sheep and, and she had a, a lamb and vegetable operation. So he, he was in heaven and he drove like three or four hours, stayed there for the better part of a week, worked on this lady's farm. He came back. He called me. I said, what'd you think? And he said, I'm way too old to get into the root vegetable business. He said, man, I was hurting. Uh, and he said, you know, there was another gal there that was, um, uh, a con contract labor that was helping this other farm out. And she had her own vegetable farm. And he said, she was, she was a couple years older than me. She was in her early forties. And she told me she was looking for a way to get out. She needed to transition her farm from vegetable production, or at least that style of vegetable production to something else, because she just physically couldn't keep up with the demands anymore. And he said, I also figured out I wasn't that crazy about sheep. So the point is, you know, Patrick was ready to invest a lot of money, well over five figures into building a greenhouse and rolling out this veggie operation. And he had done all this stuff I'm talking about uh, and had decided this is the enterprise for me. And then when he actually went and worked in that enterprise for a week, he had a, you know, pretty, pretty uh, uh, stark reality check and, and figured out pretty fast 
this isn't something I want to go do. And I don't want to blow my money on this. So I'm, you know, I'm going to go a different direction. And that kind of forethought, that kind of, you know, taking the time to make sure before you spend a bunch of money can be a real big lifesaver. Now, choosing the right enterprise. Once you're committed to an enterprise, do the following analysis. What are the profit margins on the product? You know, how much can you produce on your land base? What's the competition like in your area? How skilled are you at this enterprise? And what are your marketing options? You got to start to get an idea like, okay, I've decided, you know, I want to do pork. And then you do a little market analysis. Oh, holy smokes. There are six other people doing uh, pasture raised or forest raised non GMO and or organic pork within a hundred miles of my farm. And they're all selling to local restaurants and at farmer's markets. I'm not saying you shouldn't do pork. What I'm saying is maybe that's not the best place to start. So, you know, if the farmer's markets are overrun with your, your ideal preferred product, then you've either got to find a different sales outlet. If, if it, farmer's markets were it, and now that's not an option, you got to figure out some other way to sell it, or you're going to have to focus on a different product altogether. And if you're forced to focus on a different product, you know, how does that coexist with your, your personal context that you just went through? You know, well, nobody's doing poultry. I, I could hop into poultry tomorrow and probably sell it without too much problem. But poultry was the fifth thing I listed. I really don't want to do chickens. Well, th this is where the rubber meets the road and it becomes so much more important to write down and list out like, okay, I'm going to go do chickens for two years so I can get my foot in the door. And then I'm going to build some customers up and then I'm going to add this other product and then I'm going to add this product and then I'm going to drop chickens, right? It's a means to an end. I'm going to, I think I got to do chickens for three, maybe four years and then I'm done because I really don't want to do chickens. But if that's what I have to do to get this thing going, that's what I'm going to do. So, you know, if your answers don't totally overlap for that ideal enterprise, again, you're just going to have to assess, like, can you live with operating a different enterprise in the short term because of the long-term goal, right, of attaining that ideal enterprise? So, again, outline this, define it, what it looks like, why you're doing it, that's just so much more important. Now, what we're going to do next is we're actually going to take a look at a, a, a pastured poultry enterprise. And we're just going to look at poultry here. I don't have time in this presentation to go through pork and beef um, uh, like I do in the, the full length version of this. But we'll take a really hard look at pastured poultry because generally speaking, like if you're looking at livestock, chickens are on your list to at least check out. Um, so here are the pros. The pros as I see them, I've been doing chickens for 12 years, so I think, I think I've got a pretty good idea of what the pros and the cons are. Um, they are a very an uh, easy animal to manage. They're not scary. They're little, um, you know, they're, they're just not frightening. They're a low initial capital investment cost to begin. I mean, you get some chicks in the mail. I mean, maybe they're a buck and a quarter a piece shipped to your local post office. They're just not a lot of money. Uh, they're pretty low risk. I mean, yeah, you're going to have some deaths early on. There's definitely a lot to learn in the brooder and, and in the field. Um, but, you know, if one of them dies, you're out a few dollars. You're not out a couple of hundred dollars like you are with a pig or maybe even a thousand dollars with a cow. Um, there's no permanent infrastructure required. You don't have to go build fence. Um, and, you know, 500 chickens, they only require about one acre of land per year. So if you've got a modest sized piece of property, you can go run a batch of chickens. Uh, if you've got five acres, you can make a very nice, tidy income doing nothing but poultry. And you would have enough grass that you could raise a couple of cows. Now, are cows then going to be a, you know, a huge boon? Uh, to your, your financial bottom line? No, but you could raise some for yourself and a little bit to sell. 
um, it really just does not take much land to have a pretty substantial pasture poultry enterprise. Very fast ROI. Return on investment is eight to nine weeks. So if you can if you can cash flow this for a couple of months and you got a head on your shoulders and you can figure out a, a couple of ways to begin selling some product, you can start seeing that money come back to you really fast. There's the added benefit of free nitrogen on the pasture. They leave a lot of it. It makes grass grow really, really fast. Uh, if you do chickens very long, you will have to either uh, find someone to make hay on that pasture or you'll have to get some ruminants to graze it because it will make the grass go bonkers. They're physically easy to manage if they get loose. Again, you know, a, a full grown broiler chicken uh, that's on the upper end of the scales, like seven pounds. Okay. He's not going to bowl you over. And it offers even the youngest people an opportunity to be involved. My kids, when they were little, when I started with chickens, uh, you know, they could go out there and be involved because they could pick up a baby chick. You know, they could help me, uh, you know, feed them and put some water in there. They got to be involved. They got to spend time with dad. So that was a, a big positive. Now, here are the cons with pasture poultry. Um, you know, the chickens require scale to make it worthwhile. Four to 500 per batch is best. It is much more expensive per unit or per chicken if you're only doing 100 at a time. Now, I think fully that's where you start. You start small, you work your way up. But to really make this thing tick, you got to do four to 500 at a time. And again, I'll refer you to that other presentation that's on the YouTube channel about pasture poultry to see why that is. They are extremely labor intensive. I mean, extremely labor intensive. They've got to be cared for two to three times per day, seven days a week, no exceptions. Um, you're not going anywhere Sunday afternoon because you got to go make sure that the waters are working and add water uh, for the chickens because it's 100 degrees outside and if the water clogs you'll have dead birds within two or three hours. Very high price compared to a conventional food equivalent three to four hundred percent higher um, for a, a grocery store conventional chicken and probably even 200 percent higher for a quote-unquote organic chicken. I sell my whole chickens for 5.49 a pound. I feel confident right now I could walk into a Trader Joe's anywhere in the United States and get a certified organic chicken. Mine are not certified. I think they're better, but they're not certified. They're fed certified organic feed, but the end product does not have that lovely little sticker on it. Trader Joe's about anywhere, it's going to be $2.99 a pound, almost half price for a certified organic chicken in a grocery store. Butchers can be really difficult to locate and or very far away. And we talked a lot about this um, on, on our podcast. If butchering on farm is something you're interested in, I'll refer you to the uh, pasture poultry processing course. It's now available out at grassfedlife.co. If you think you want to butcher on farm, that's a no brainer. Look at that course. Um, it may be your only option. I know guys that like their butchers four or five hours away. That's each direction. It's two trips. You're talking two full days commitment every time there is a batch of birds. That makes scaling up all the more important. You don't want to be doing that with 100 birds very long. You want to get up five, 600 birds, make that trip really count, amortize that cost. Some equipment is one use and very expensive. I list chicken crates as an example. The stupid things are $60 a piece. You use them a few times a year. They otherwise sit there and collect dust. It's not like a livestock trailer. You can put any critter imaginable in a livestock trailer and use it all year long. That chicken crate has got one use. Most chicken tractors are one use. My chicken tractor design, you can, you can use it for other things. That's why I call it a multi-use chicken tractor design. Um, but you know, this equipment, while it's not permanent and it's mobile, it's it's got one use it's not like a fence that can be used to manage multiple animals it's extremely seasonal and limited to six to nine months out of the year in most regions for me here it's about six months that's all i get um if you live in a region that's really warm you might get nine months or ten but you know i know guys down in in texas that raise uh broilers and once they get to about you know june the middle of june they shut it down and then they don't fire it back up until they're getting into the middle or end of August and they'll, they'll start, start their brooder back up because it's just too hot. Um, 
you know, pigs and cows in most climates, you can raise them 12 months out of the year if you want to. Uh, they are very, very influenced by weather and volatile during extreme heat, humidity, or cold and rain. Uh, our joke here is, um, you know, you, you go out to check on the chickens and the chickens are like, hey, it's, it's, it's Tuesday. Um, you know, how can I possibly die today? That, that's my goal is to die before you get me to the butcher. Uh, if, if there's extreme weather, they can be tough to manage. Now, here are some quick mathematics going through poultry. Um, and again, that pasture poultry presentation, we get into this a little bit more deeper, but for the purposes of this, um, you need, you know, uh, 5,500 square feet of pasture per chicken tractor. And this is using one of my chicken tractors, 120 square feet. And if you've got uh, six chicken tractors, you got 33,000 uh, square feet per batch. Uh, do the math. That's roughly four fifths of an acre. So I say an acre. Um, a cost analysis, which we're not going to go into here, um, if we run 500 birds, okay, and if we do six batches per year, that's, that's 3,000 birds, and there's a caveat to this, I'll circle back to this in a minute, uh, it's $4,500 per batch, okay, that equals uh, $27,000, all right, now using some wholesale pricing, uh, the, the value is almost $7,000 per batch. So you've got about $2,450 in profit per batch. Okay. Now this is all whole chickens. I'm not getting into retail chickens and cutting stuff up again, that pasture poultry presentation gets deeper into all this, but for, for this purpose, let's just say you make $2,500 per batch. Okay. That's not a lot of profit. And that's, a, that's a lot of birds. That's a lot of birds. I, I maxed out at 3,000 chickens. You got to get pretty creative to start selling that many chickens, at least in my region. Okay. Now, if you're Paul Grieve and you're in Southern California and you have 20 million people within two hours of you, uh, 3,000 chickens, if, if you've got some uh, marketing swag, that's a drip in the bucket. All right. Uh, there are also fewer producers out there. Here, there are lots of producers. It's back to what we talked about earlier. How many people are doing this in your area? Um, now, looking at some retail pricing, you might have $9,000 in value per batch. Okay, so we can make quite a bit more money, about $4,500 a batch. Um, gives you an idea of, you know, what you can expect with an enterprise if you can move that many chickens. Again, 3,000 birds is a lot of chickens, and it's going to take you quite a while to get your business built up to the point that you can raise and sell that many birds. Now, um, uh, note that with retail pricing, um, that does not take into account any kind of discounted pricing. Uh, if you, I've talked a lot about on the podcast, my chicken CSA, which is our bulk program. If you're doing, you know, a, like a 15 or 20 percent, you know, discount. Uh, you know, to stores or restaurants or something like that. That's, that's selling these birds full retail price. To do that, you're doing a farmer's market. And it's going to be a good farmer's market at that. So, uh, in conclusion, these are some, some points I want to uh, bring up for you to think about after going through this, this process. Tread carefully when you're selecting an enterprise. And never make a decision based solely on what you want to do or what you're most passionate about. Don't make an emotional decision. Passion and emotion come into the equation, but if you, if you make your uh, enterprise choice based solely upon that, it's gonna set you up for failure. Try to choose an enterprise uh, that aligns with your land, your life, and your finances as best you can. We're probably gonna have to, you know, make some sacrifices. We may not be able to do exactly what we want to do as fast as we want to do it, but do the best you can where those things overlap. Uh, make certain that all decision makers are involved from the outset. So if you've got a business partner or a spouse uh, that's, you know, in this with you, and if you have a spouse, even if they're not helping you with this enterprise, like they're a decision maker because financially this affects them. Again, this is something that Diego talks a whole lot about in a, a holistic context module that we're really proud of. Um, you've you've got to make sure that that any anyone that's a decision maker 
have some input on this, that you, you come together and decide, okay, this is what we're going to do first. And this is how much money we're going to, we're going to throw at it. We're going to put that money into a business checking account. We're going to hold each other accountable. And like, we've got to make it fly with that amount of money. That's so important. Uh, one thing I want to mention too, is that, you know, every aspect of a farm is going to affect your family in either a negative or positive way. So you want to make certain they are fully on board. Again, if your spouse isn't going to help you with this farm enterprise, that's fine, but they still need to be on board because it's going to affect them. It's going to trickle down. It takes you away from the family. It takes money you might be using for something else like a college fund or uh, to pay off debt and you're, you're now throwing it at this business. That affects them. So again, make sure you realize this is going to have an effect on them even if they're not physically involved. Um, and if you can't take on your ideal enterprise initially, it's all the more important to define in writing why are you taking on a different enterprise? Okay define your goals for how long you'll run the alternate enterprise and how long it will take you to begin your desired enterprise. Review, review your enterprises annually and adjust, add, or delete after running through this process again. That is not something I've done a good job at until recently, just the, the past few years. Um, just because you've always done something or just because you're known for a product doesn't mean you should continue to do it. Uh, I had a good friend of mine that he no longer lives here. Um, he was a veg producer and we were having a discussion one day and John was like very cutting edge. He was like, he started doing salad green mixes 14, 15 years ago. Nobody else in Indianapolis was doing salad green mixes back then. And he did a lot of them and he made really good money with them. And he absolutely hated doing salad green mix. He, he loathed the idea of continuing to do it, but he said, you know, I don't feel like I can give it, give it up because like, this is what our farm is known for. This is what put us on the map. This is what the, like people expect us to have this product. And that's not a good enough answer. You know, if you, if you get to a point and you really don't like doing something, well, maybe it's time to back it down or uh, put it on hiatus for a year. Maybe you hand it off to somebody else, whatever. Uh, but you got to review that annually and, again, adjust, add, or delete to and from your farm after going through this process. And finally, I'll say you've got to be very realistic when setting these goals. I think we're all really bad about using – you know, uh, the best data that says, okay, we can get five pound chickens and we can do it in seven and a half weeks and we can use this minimal amount of feed and they're going to eat this much grass and all these things uh, only to find out that, well, it took eight and a half weeks and my chickens didn't even hit four pounds and they used 20% more feed than I had calculated um, and they didn't taste as great as I thought they would. So be realistic when you're setting your goals so that you don't set yourself up for failure. Uh, so to learn more, uh, if you're not already familiar with what we do at Grassfed Life, you can go to the, the web, website, grassfedlife.co. Uh, out there, you'll find a, a free weekly podcast. There are also some blog articles out there. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Grassfed Life Podcast. There's a lot of information out there. Uh, we've also got a YouTube channel, which is not that old. Uh, there's quite a bit of content on it already, though, so feel free to check us out there. Uh, and if you're serious about farming, again, you know, consider looking into the course. Um, there are over 10 different proven methods from my farm to sell product. There's spreadsheets on all this stuff. This isn't made up. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, you know, uh, lollipops and unicorns, and we hope for the best. There's real data to back this up, 12 years of data. Uh, we're on our production, on our labor with the animals. That's, that's kind of how we set things here. We're trying to pay ourselves about 50 bucks an hour. Um, and that's, that's always our goal. Sometimes we do better than that. Sometimes we do worse than that. Um, 
You also get direct access to myself and a private Facebook group. Um, course total, there's 23 modules out there. Everything needed to start, run, succeed with a farm business. That's our goal. Again, it's not just raising the livestock. It's knowing everything else, the marketing, the business setup, branding, spreadsheets, time management. I, there's just a lot that goes into it. So, uh, and then also I'll mention too, um, cause a lot of people don't know, we've got a standalone pasture poultry course. Uh, that's all from the main course, but it just focuses on chickens. So if you think that's where you want to start, um, I think it's a great course. It's a fraction of the cost. Uh, and then I mentioned earlier, that we've now also got a brand new, as in released very recently, standalone processing course. So if you think chicken is where you want to start and you don't have any processors, check out the uh, course that we just did with Ben Grimes. Uh, it is, I, we're really proud of that. There's a ton of information in that course and currently you can get it for 99 bucks. 